I hope you came ready to praise God today. Has he been good to you this week? Ah, oh, come on, you can do better than that. You're alive today. Has he been good? Amen. I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Come on Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith the Son of God. Believe that Jesus Christ came to set us free. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't you love him today? Yes. Praise the Lord. 
for all he done on the cross. I love you, Jesus. I love you today, Father. You took the nails. You took the crown. You took the beating. I love you, Jesus. Oh, you're really thankful. 
Come on, are you really thankful today that your sins are gone? Hallelujah! Praise the Lamb of God! Come on and shout and praise Him. Worship and praise Him. Aren't you glad your sins are under the blood? Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. Come on, lift the roof on this place. Praise my life. Praise Him. Come on. Oh, praise Him. Paid it all. Oh, 
you hear my Had left the crimson stain. <laughs> Jesus, you washed this old sinner white as snow. I love him. I love him because he first loved me and purchased my salvation on I'm just taking a moment to worship him. I don't even know you're here. Don't care about it. I'm just worshiping him. Just, just let me do it. <laughs> My mama used to sing this song. My sins are forgiven. Forgotten for a my sins are forgiven they're all washed away he forgot all my sin there at calvary he forgot all my sin but he remembered me. <laughs> then she would sing, Now I'm living for Jesus, and I'm happy today. Why? Because my sins. <laughs> Woo, are forgiven. They're all washed away. He forgot all my sin. There at Calvary, he forgot all my sin, but he remembers me. Go ahead and praise him. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Try to pray, Pastor, but <coughs> God sang it. Jesus paid it all. Took my breath away. Because I remember what it was when Jesus found him. And he went to a cross, paid for it. How, how could we ever get over that? You can't describe it. You can't, <clears throat> you can't say how a man would, on Saturday, be dirty and filthy and disgusting to his own self, but on Sunday morning be clean, be born again. First time in my life I ever looked in the mirror and didn't feel ashamed. First time in my life I ever looked in the mirror and didn't feel less than everybody else. Oh. Father, I thank you so much. God, I don't have the words to say to be thankful for what you've done for me. But dear God, I know that you've done it for so many others. All those, dear God, that will accept you, will you do that for them? Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Dear God, your provision for me through the years has just been unbelievable. You've always been there. 
And dear God, I pray this morning that folks would realize that you're there for them. Dear God, I pray for every person in this sanctuary, every person in the sound of this voice. Dear God, I pray that you bless them. Help them, Lord, to know that you're the great provider. You're the great Savior. You're the great one that can do everything for them they need done. Father, have your way in this service today. Dear God, bless Pastor as he brings the bread of life. Dear God, and help us, Father, not to only be hearers, but the doers of your word. Father, have your way in every part of the service, and we'll give you praise and honor in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and give him the greatest praise you've given him all morning. Just go ahead and let it out of your spirit. Come on, can you say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. The greatest, most wonderful liberty in the world is to express our deepest and heartfelt gratitude for all that Christ has done for us through the finished work of the cross. Amen. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful, beautiful, brisk November Sunday morning. I stood outside a moment ago in the sun, a little cool air. It actually felt pretty nice. Uh, but it feels even better in here because the presence of the Lord is so wonderful. Do you feel what I feel? I know people say, well, it's not all in feeling. You're right. It's not all in feeling. But a dead man knows he's dead and a live man knows he's alive, too. <laughs> It's wonderful every now and then to feel that tug from another world and another realm. Huh? I don't know about you, I need that every now and then. And Peter said it this way, that there would be times of refreshing that would come from the presence of the Lord. And I've sensed that wonderful and strange and mysterious presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. At least for me, if, no, if nobody else, it's been for me. Amen. I want you to please take a moment, and I want you to do it with, with exuberance. You know what that word means? That means at least smile. <laughs> and I want you to, with exuberance, welcome our online congregation. Let them know we're glad that they're with us today. <laughs> we welcome Life Change Media Church. We're so thrilled, so honored to have you as a part of our church, right where you are, wherever you may be. Maybe, you, maybe you've stumbled across us or someone told you about us and you're here for the first time. Or maybe you've been attending online for some time and you would like to find out a little bit more about us. Or maybe you're, you're interested in being a member of the Life Change Church Media Church. And I, I, want you to, I want you to text the number on your screen. Give us your name and address and we're going to send some information to you and contact you. And you can get to know us a little bit more, and we can get to know you a little bit more. And isn't it awesome how God can couple our faith together, and we can accomplish some great things for the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit can work here and there, wherever you are. And I believe God's doing something incredible in this last final hour of human history. And you and I are going to be a part of it. Congregation, let them know one more time. We love them, and they're part of us. And maybe you're here for the first time in the sanctuary right here or maybe you've been here for some time and you want to find out how you can get more involved with our church text the number that's on the screen right now that is a text line for our church and we will contact you we'll be in touch with you and uh, thank you thank you so much for being being here we want you to know that we love you but I can't say we love you as much as Jesus does because boy does he ever does he ever love you Esther's, I want you to get in place, and let's, let's get ready to receive the morning tithe and offering. Thank you for your giving. I want to thank you online for your giving. Uh, so many of you are faithful each week here and, and wherever you are to, to support what God is doing through your faithfulness and through your obedience to God. Giving is an act of obedience, and we're so thankful that you're obeying God with your tithe and your offering. Father... I pray that you'll bless this offering, multiply it, and use it for your glory, not our sake, for your glory. Use it to establish your covenant, to lift up your son. In Jesus' name, amen.
Don't forget, during the month of November, we're having Wednesday night services, and uh, we're also giving a meal out during that, during those Wednesday nights, so uh, come out. We had a great time this past uh, Wednesday night, and dinner hour is 6 to 7. You can come anytime during that hour and eat, and then church starts at 7 o'clock, and we're doing that in the youth building, so come out this coming Wednesday night and be a part of that event. I want to let you know, I just returned from Haiti this past week and on a, on a two-week trip there, and God is doing some great things uh, with our partner there in Haiti, Open Door Haiti. And uh, I want to let you know that our, our orphanage expansion there is, is going well. They've got the foundation in, and uh, we got all that set, and they're, they're pouring the floor this coming week, and uh, God's doing great things as we, as we expand our orphanage and also expand the school there and uh, make more classroom space for our preschool there with Open Door Haiti. And while I was in Haiti, I got a phone call from our, uh, our ministry partner in Pakistan, uh, Pastor John Javed, and God is just doing some incredible things. Revival has broke out in Pakistan, and God's just an awesome God and what he's doing there. You know, we've told you how they're using our church services. They take a video projector, and they take a team of people and a computer and a laptop, and they, they send those people out into different villages around Pakistan, and they show them on a screen our church services. Well, he called me because he wanted to let me know they have showed their 250th show, uh, showing of our church service this year, 250, and from those 250, 2,800 people have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's right, I said 2,800 people have come to know Jesus because of our outreach and their work there in Pakistan. So God is doing some exciting stuff around the world, and we just want to keep you up to date with what he's doing. One of our biggest local outreaches of the year is coming up in just a couple weeks. November 16th on a Sunday night is our Thanksgiving outreach. And uh, we want you to be a part of that. You make sure you're here to help give out the turkeys. We need lots of volunteers that night to help us out. And also, if, if you've not given to that financially, you can do that by going to our website. And also, let me say, if you know a family here in the Claremont County area that is going to need help for the Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving season and maybe with the turkey and the meal, um, have them go to our website and register for the event and, and be a part of that. So help us get the word out with that. We've, uh, I think we've had about 160 families that are signed up right now. And so we have pre-ordered 250 turkeys. So uh, help us get the word out. If you know somebody that you know that is, is in need, uh, get them on our website, sign up and register for that event. Uh, also, we need volunteers to come out on November 14th. That's a Friday night, the Friday before the event at 6 o'clock. We're going to be packing all the bags. So if we can get uh, a lot of volunteers out on that night, it'll go really quick, and uh, it'll be awesome time. So be here on November 14th to help us pack for our Thanksgiving outreach. This is my first time ever on camera, and the camera loves me. Hey Life Change, on November 21st, we're going to go ahead and have our first overnighter with me as the youth pastor. It's going to be held at Laser Craze in Erlinger, Kentucky, and we're going to go ahead and leave from the church at 11.15. So your teens need to be here at about 10.45, and we'll be back at 7 a.m. here at the church. I'm really excited because this is going to be a chance for me to take out all my pent-up frustration on your kids by throwing dodgeballs at them and gunning them down with laser tag. So again, it's November 21st, be here at 10.45, we'll be back at the church at 7 a.m. You need to go to our website and get the permission slip because your kids probably didn't give it to you already. You also need to go to Laser Craze's website and fill out the waiver so that they can absolve themselves uh, of any possible injuries that'll be caused by me on your kids. So we'll see you then. Last year we did this and we're doing it again. This year is our, it's our Christmas Hope Box for Open Door Haiti. Uh, we need you to help us be a part of this event. Uh, we're collecting uh, boxes. 
uh, shoe box size boxes and uh, with all kinds of goodies in it. You're going to get one of these flyers on the way out the door today. Will you please help us by participating in this, purchasing a box and some of the items in there and get those back in here. Hope boxes need to be returned uh, here to Life Change by November 23rd. Uh, Sunday, November 23rd. So please have your boxes back in because then we have to ship them to Florida so that they can be uh, loaded onto the container to head to um, Haiti in the early part of December. So uh, they're hoping all of these hope boxes can get there before Christmas time. So help us out. Become a part of this great, great program and ch helping change the lives and make a better Christmas for those kids in Haiti.
Praise God. Turn with me in your Bible this morning to Psalm 22, verse 30 and 31. Psalm 22, verse 30 and 31. I'm going to have you stand, please, in reverence of God's Word. Psalm 22, verse 30 and 31. Give me just a little bit more. I'm having a little trouble with my voice, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Psalm 22, verse 30 and 31. A seed shall serve him. It It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation, for they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. I want you to look at verse 30. A seed shall serve him, and it will be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Here we are right at harvest time. The farmers are in the field with their combines, and they're gathering in the harvest. You determine a seed by the harvest. And for a few weeks here, we're going to be dealing with the nature of a seed. The nature of a seed. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I thank you and praise you. For this people that have gathered today, they're your people. None of them are here by accident. But all of them are here providentially guided by you. Brought to this place. They got up this morning and decided to come, but they decided to come because you put in them the desire to be here. They're here by your grace. And I pray that each one will be receptive to your word. God, would you break up the fallow ground of our heart? Would you plant deep within us that which you want inside of each of us? Help us to be that which you want us to be. We look to you and trust you and believe you. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. The wise man said in Proverbs 30, there is a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation Oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up proud. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. The wise man said, there is a generation, I believe, that the generation he describes there is in the world right now. Who curses their father, who, who disrespects and dishonors their mother. Who are pure in their own minds and in their own right, but yet God says you're filthy. Who are lofty in their thinking and pride, rules and reigns their hearts who will chew you up and spit you out the moment you don't agree with their position and their ideas. That defines where we are. I think of the generations, there's always at least three or four alive on the earth. There's a few left that were part of my mother's generation, my father's. World War II people. Do you realize of that generation... 85%. Now think of that. Let us sink in. 85% claimed Christianity. Now that does not mean that all of them were born again and had a deep, profound experience of God's grace. What it means, though, is they had respect and fear for God, respect for the church, respect for the Bible, and they they housed within their mindset a Judeo-Christian worldview. 85%. Eighty-five percent. 
If you back that down to the baby boom generation, my oldest brother Bob, his generation, 55% of them claim Christianity. That's their worldview. That's where they come from. A biblical principle that kind of guides their morality, you could say. You go to the busters, then uh, that would be kind of my brother Tim, and, and down to where my age group is, right around there. Actually, me, I'm kind of in no man's land between a couple of them, and I seemingly, that defines me, I've always lived in no man's land. <laughs> but uh, uh, that generation, I, I believe it's around 35%, 25 to 35% of them claim Christianity. Come to generation X, and it gets down to around 10 or 12 percent in America but of those who are in college all the way back to kindergarten right now in America right now in this nation four percent now listen to that four four percent everyone say four. four that means if you line up 100 of that generation in front of this congregation 96 of them are Muslims, humanists, secular humanists, atheists, agnostics, nothing, Wiccans, witches. Do you know that the two fastest growing religions in America are the Islamic faith and witchcraft, Satan worship? In America, two fastest growing religions, Islamic faith and witchcraft. You leave America and almost everywhere else in the world, the fastest growing religion. You know what it is? Christianity. It's real quiet in this place. Think of it. The, this, this nation, which was a sounding board for the gospel for nearly 200 years to the world, sent more missionaries than any nation in the history of mankind have produced more preachers than any nation in the annals of history. This nation founded upon the precepts and principles of, of God's Word deeply rooted to where you can't walk in any public building. And even though we've tried to do away with it, they're still carved out in wood and, and chiseled out in stone. The Ten Commandments in almost every courthouse in the whole United States of America deeply rooted, steeped in the truths and principles of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who gave his son Jesus. That's who we are. But yet, but yet, 4%, 4%, you know what's the most alarming thing? Is you're not alarmed. The scariest thing is that you're not scared. I'm all too afraid that we gather in conclave behind our, uh, our walls with no windows and darkness. And we, 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 we just think one of these days everything's going to be all right. And you've got to hear this preacher. The solution is not gathering together and singing a few songs on Sunday and getting blessed about going to heaven and raising my hands when the pastor says, no, the solution to what's happening right now, we need a revival. We need a generation to be awakened. We need the solution. Hear me. The solution to the problem found in Psalm 22. He said, a seed shall serve him. And it will be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now listen to me. Psalm 22 is a prophetic psalm written by David. And I don't know how or when it happened. And I'm not even sure he understood what he was writing when he wrote it. 
I don't know if one Friday he said, you know, we got church tomorrow because they had it on Saturday. I'm putting it in our terminal. He said, we got church tomorrow, and I want to write a new worship song for Todd to sing and for Edwin to play. And so he started writing, and the Holy Spirit took over his pen and took over his mind, and he started writing and describing the events of Calvary. The Christ who would die on the cross. He wrote it out in song. He got it all the way down there, baby. I mean, he got it all. Why hast thou forsaken me? David wrote Psalm 22. And he wrote about Jesus. But listen, those last couple of verses are not only applicable to Jesus, but they are applicable to us. He said, a seed shall serve him. God is, is not trying to get the whole generation. He's trying to gather a seed. And if he can gather a seed, he'll get the whole generation. I think of just our church in Claremont County in Cincinnati, and I think of where we are, and we may look around and say, look what God has done. There's been a great harvest. When I came here 13 years ago, maybe 150 people, whatever it may have been, and certainly we have seen growth. And we get this idea, 150 to nearly 1,000 people. That's phenomenal in Batavia. That's a wonderful thing in Claremont County. And God has brought a great harvest. I want you to listen to me. The last 13 years, God has not brought a harvest to this church. All God is doing is trying to gather a seed. The size of the seed will determine how big the harvest is going to be. Do you hear me? He said, I got to have a seed that will serve me. And if they'll serve me, I'll get the whole thing. God is not interested in just us gathering on Sunday morning. No, he has brought us together because he said, I'm going after Claremont County and I'm going after Cincinnati and I'm going to go after the state of Ohio and I'm going to go after the United States of America. I want to start a fire here that'll spread its way across the landscape of our culture and change the very face of our nation. I, I want to tell you something. There is a generation that can be changed by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. There is a generation lofty, sinful, hell-bound, cursing father, cursing mother. God can get a seed together. He can change that generation. I don't know what you signed up for this morning, but I hope you didn't sign up for a short sermon because I didn't come with one. What I did come with was a message from heaven, a message from God. I did not come with a sermon at all. This morning when I got up in the 845 service, I didn't know what to say. I prayed all week. I asked God, what do you want me to say? I don't have anything. I want to tell you this morning, the Holy Ghost has filled my heart and filled my mind. And I got something to say. This is not a man talking. And I hope you can look beyond my personality and look beyond the frailty of my flesh and look beyond Troy, Troy Price servant and say there's a man from heaven. He's got, a, he's got a voice from God. He's got a word from God. And that's what I've got for you this morning. Morning. Open your eyes, open your ears, open your heart, and get ready because God is about to do something in this building that's going to change Claremont County. I believe it. I believe it. He said, A seed shall serve him. How does a seed serve God? By doing what a seed does. You don't serve God how you want to serve God. You serve God by the nature of how God expects you to serve him. And the way we serve God is doing what a seed does. What is the nature of a seed? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work a little bit today because I am a construction worker. 
and I'm a farmer, and I till the ground, and I work with shovels. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Every year when we plant a garden, we did in this past year because I just didn't have time to do it. But every year when we, when we plant that garden, I get out there in that hot sun. I mean blazing hot sun. On a hot spring day, the beads of sweat forming upon my brow and dripping down my face. If I could just get Mandy to bring me a glass of water even, it would be wonderful. <laughs> you know what I do? She plants the seed, but I'm the one that tills the ground. Have any idea how hot it is riding that tractor? <laughs> I ought to bring Mandy up for this part. <laughs> What's the nature of a seed? The nature of a seed, first of all, is to die. Jesus said, except this, except this corn of wheat fall, which in this case is a pumpkin seed, unless this seed fall to the earth and die, it remains in it. Unless it falls to the earth and dies. Paul said it this way, it's not me that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. We've changed that verse around in America in the church. Now it's not he that lives, but me. In the life that I live, I live by the appeasement of my own flesh. I just preached something right there. Hear me? Paul said it's not me that lives, but he. But nowadays, we preach it. It's not he that lives, but me. And the life that I live, I live by the appeasement of what I want. I'm preaching the truth. He said, unless it falls to the earth and dies, cover it up. The nature of a seed is to die. And listen to me, gang. It has always been the call of Christ, the command of the gospel. He minces no words. He doesn't back up an ounce. He, he always clearly defines the lines. He draws the proverbial line in the sands of time. Watch him as he walks along the sandy shores of Galilee or raises his voice on the pebble stone streets of Jerusalem, or stands outside the temple, and he looks at the swelling mobs of people, and he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. Look at Christ. Look at him as he stands in John chapter 6. After having fed 5,000 men, Scholars say not including women and children perhaps. Maybe there were 10, perhaps 15,000 people. But we know there were 5,000 he had fed. The next day they boarded boats, went to Capernaum, finding Jesus. Why? Because they wanted him to do it again. Give us a good show. Put on a good circus. Do something miraculous. And then give us some more bread. Appease my flesh. If that does not define the 
church in America that's made a God out of money, made a God out of my flesh, made a God out of my pride. And if you can appease someone long enough to get them in the seat and make them feel good about their sin and make them feel good about what they're doing, even though God's against what they're doing, then you'll build a big church. I want to tell you this morning, Christ never intended to build a big church. He only intended to build the church. He never intended for men to follow him for what they could get. He intended them to follow him for what they could give. Do you hear me? We've messed it all up. Look at that swall- swelling mob of people. This is what he says. This is your Bible. Can I preach the Bible this morning? He looks at them and he says, unless you are willing to eat my body and drink my blood, you're not fit for my kingdom. You're not in. They knew what that meant. I mean, those Jewish men knew exactly what that meant. We may not know it like they knew it. But when he said that, knew, they knew exactly. He was talking about the Seder meal. Every one of them at one point had seen or done. They'd taken that live, beautiful, spotless lamb, slit the throat and spilled the blood in a bowl. Every one of them had cooked that lamb and ate every bit of it and consumed every bit of it. What Jesus was saying, he was saying, unless you are willing to partake in my death, then you'll never partake in my life. If you don't suffer with me, then you won't reign with me. If you don't go down where I go, you won't go up where I go. Do you hear what I'm telling you, church? Jesus was saying, you must be willing to lay down your life, your wishes, your dreams, your whims, and say, I die to myself and my selfishness and what I want, and my life will be lived totally and completely by the will of Christ, surrendering myself totally and completely to his lordship. Do you hear what I'm preaching today? I know it's foreign. I know it goes against the grain. I know that nobody preaches it. But it's the Bible. It's God's way. It's the truth. It's what Christ calls us to. True biblical discipleship. The laying down of my life. Except the fall. Earth and die. That's the church. We've gathered here this morning. He don't have any problem getting people to gather. He don't have any problem getting people to show up. 5,000 will show up. God has no problem gathering seed, but he's having a real problem getting it to get out of the bag and on the dirt. Having real trouble getting that seed to die. Are you still with me? Real trouble getting that seed to say, Lord, my life serves one purpose. Can I define biblical theology, Christianity, as it applies to you right now? I already know the will of God for everyone's life in this place. You know what it is? My life. We've got to get to the place where we say, I exist for one purpose, your glory. Period. Your glory. Whatever that means for me, wherever I end up living, whatever life I have, I exist only for your glory. See, that's a far cry from humanism. And self-helpism in the pulpit today. That's a far cry from someone being on national TV saying, listen, all God wants is for you to be happy. Wall, loan, e. Do you hear me? I find no place in that Bible. I find a lot of places where it says to be happy, but isn't it funny? He defines happy as brother teaching here on Sunday nights. You might want to show up. He defines happy as poor in spirit and broken and, and empty and blessed. Happy are they that are poor in spirit. Happy are they that are hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Happy are they that are persecuted. Happy. He, that's how he defines happiness. We define happiness as I got a new Armani suit and a bunch of money in the bank and I've got a car driving and I've got cable TV and I've got... 
I got my family all here. God's not taking anybody. God's not allowed anyone to die. God's not allowed everyone's well. Man, I'm preaching good right now. God always, Christ always came right to the person. It's all through the Bible. Think about it. He says to one guy, he says, follow me. And the guy says, listen, listen, my dad just died. Let me, let me take care of that. And he, Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. He goes right to the heart of the matter. All you've done is try to please your earthly father and ignored your heavenly father. He goes, yeah. Yeah. He says to another guy, follow me. He says, I just got married. He said, unless you hate your wife, you've allowed that woman to define who you're going to be. It's getting real quiet. Look at the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus. He says, I've been a good boy. He said, I, I have kept the commands from my youth. And I don't find anywhere where Jesus disputed him. Now, we know that he wasn't perfect. Everyone sinned. But Jesus didn't argue with the fact that he was a good guy. Am, am I alone all of a sudden? Because I feel resistance coming. That's okay. You're, you're still living. If I get you to die, you'll like what I'm preaching. You know what I'm saying? It's hard. You ever try to kill somebody? I'm not saying I have. I'm just, <laughs> you, you know, if you try to, you ever, you ever watch someone get murdered on one of those shows, movie or TV? Watch someone get murdered. They'll fight for it, won't they? Yeah. I feel like you're fighting me right now, but I got to tell you something. I got a big knife. <laughs> that rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He says, I've been a good boy. And Jesus, he doesn't dispute it. I mean, when we look at him, we say, my, my word, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. But Jesus said, hey, listen, you're keeping those commands. He says, but I, you know, I've been going to church. And when preacher says, raise my hand, I raise it. And when they sang, I'm going home with Jesus, and other people stood up and clapped, I stood up too. And when they passed the offering, I threw a dollar in. I'm good. And Jesus looks at this man, and he says, one thing I got to one thing. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And follow me. Oh. Go. Isn't it interesting how Christ always goes to the heart of a man? And the guy drops his head and he walks away sorrowfully. There's a couple things here. One, it's, it's, it's powerful as it screams out of the scripture. What's not there? And what's not there is Christ did not run after him. He did not beg him. He did not coax him. He did not coddle him. He did not say, well, I went for too much. No, he, he did not go after him. He let him walk away. And you need to get a hold of the fact that the sovereign God we serve will not beg you to love him. He won't beg you to give your life. He always goes right to the heart, Tom. Sell everything he had. And we, we use that to say it's wrong to have money. No. The problem with that man wasn't the fact he had money. The problem was the money had him. Yeah. I want to ask you. Look at me. What has your heart? You that are online. What has your heart? Christ has a way of going right to the heart of a man. You know why he does it? Because Christ, every time he talked to someone about following him, you know what he would do? You're going to like this. He would take their breath away from them. I mean, the guy's breathing. He, I've kept this law. I've done this and I've done that. And he's breathing. And all of a sudden he says, you just lack one thing. Go sell it. <gasps> Excuse me? Come again? I'm, I'm doing this and I go to church and I do this. and I. You, what, what about this? <gasps> He always has a way of taking your breath away from you. That's what he did with the man that wanted to bury his dad. Let the dead bury. Oh, such a statement. Hate your wife. Oh, 
He always comes at you at the thing that defines who you are as a person. I am preaching so good, I can't stand myself. Do you hear what I'm telling you? This is the truth, gang. Always. It's easy for you to say, oh, look at that rich man. What's your heart wrapped up in? It's easy to say, look at that rich young ruler. What has your heart? Because that's the thing. He'll say, you're doing this. You're going to church. You're paying your tithe. You're saying amen to the preacher. You're, you're getting involved. You're being an usher. You're sweeping the floor. You're shaking hands. You're helping little kids in the nursery. You've been changed some poopy diapers. You've done it all at church. You've done it all. But then he says, what about, boom, and he punches you. <gasps> Except the seed fall to the earth and die. He was saying to that young man, die to yourself. Die to what makes you tick. Die to what gives you your strength. Die to what puffs you up. Die to that thing that defines who you are as a man or as a woman. Die to that thing that you always revert back to. Die to that thing that gives you steam inside your heart. Die to that thing that you give allegiance to. Die to that thing that you bow to. Die to that thing. Man, I'm preaching to you. Die to that. He says, he'll punch you right in the gut. He'll go right to the heart. He'll attack you right where you are. He'll bring his word and it'll pierce all the way to the morrow the bone and he'll say what about this yeah. some it could be religious pride yeah. I got it. aren't we a pretty church in there Boy, I love to go to church and hear everyone play the organ. Oh. Mm. You guys don't know how to have church, do you? I'm trying to teach you. Oh. Hallelujah. We having church today, having church today. Glory to God. We all gathered together. Woo, having ourselves a time. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. I'm saying hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to shout. I'm going to dance. I'm going to sing. I'm going to drop a hanky. I'm just having myself a time. Right? Oh, glory, glory. We're in church. I want to tell you something. The answer is not gathering in this building on Sunday morning a bunch of seed and bragging about what we have and don't have and thinking of what we are and what we ain't. It ain't about shouting a little bit about going to heaven, singing a couple of songs. No, we got to get this seed out of the bag and let it fall to the earth and die. God, let me serve you where I live. God, let me serve you where I work. God, let me bring glory to you in my life. Whatever that may be, let my life be your life. Hear me. Except it die. Except it die. Jesus shows us. This is just sermon number one. Wait till next week. You're going to really love it. I, love, I just, you know, I, I, you know I, I, in my flesh, in my flesh, I pray, God, sometimes let me preach the pretty stuff that people like. Why can't I be like those guys? People gather around it. They enjoy it. That was beautiful. You made me feel so good. I want to preach that stuff. I would love to preach that stuff. But he makes me preach this stuff. I mean, it's like I told him in the early service. We got Christmas next month. I thought, well, maybe at Christmas I'll get some pretty stuff. My luck, he'll make me preach a sermon series on hell for Christmas. Everybody come. I mean, the word will spread. You don't want to miss Church of Life Change Church. It's Christmas time. They're preaching on hell all month. Advertise that. 
someone says to someone else, we definitely want to go there and find out about that at Christmas time. Why, we got to go see. That's where we're going. Let's go, let's go listen to him preach about where we're going. Which, by the way, without Jesus, you are. I want to tell you now, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There's an eternity out there. I'm glad this morning that for the blood-bought, spirit-baptized children of God, there's a heaven. Maybe you'll let me preach about both of them at Christmas. I, I'm not advertising a hell series for December. I just, I just he's probably going to etch it on my heart. I just I feel it coming. Who wants to gather around? Who? He's going he's to continue his dying sermon series. Can't wait till next Sunday to go hear him talk about how I need to die. This is going to be great. Tell you something. Seed is very consistent with Scripture, but it's been inconsistent the way it's preached in the last 30 years. Seed has become money and words. And listen to me. I believe words and money can be seed, but they are a byproduct of the seed. The fact of the matter is you're the seed. If he can get you, then he'll have your words and your money, and he'll have blessing coming back off of all that. The seed is you. Consistency of Scripture is you're the seed. That's biblical theology. And we see it as David writes it about Jesus. And Jesus, listen, Jesus is the premier example of what I'm preaching. There's no one more lofty than he. The Prince of Glory. Heaven's best. The glory of heaven. The brilliancy and effervescence of God himself embodied in the second person of the Trinity. Perched. Do you understand how glorious and how brilliant he is? The Bible says, listen, when we get to heaven... There'll be no need for a sun or a moon because he will be the light. Jesus. Before the foundations of the earth falls from the loftiest place of the universe, actually outside the universe, the loftiest place that could be found in the mind of man and the heart of God. The pinnacle of heaven and glory. Jesus falls from that before you and I ever were, before Adam was ever created. He falls. Look at it from heaven. Except that seed fall to the earth. Look at him in the garden in anguish where God goes right to the heart of the matter. And Jesus says, if it's possible, do it another way. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, listen to him fall. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Look at him on the cross. Just, just as he always suffocated everybody that came to him and came right to the heart of who they were. What about this, the rich young ruler? Sell everything. <gasps> just as he always suffocated everyone he came in contact with to expose and to kill the flesh. Look at him on the cross. The death of a cross is the death of suffocation. The weight of your body pulled by the law of gravity and it pushes the air out of you. What men would do when they were on a cross being crucified by Romans they would take their legs and the strength of their body and push themselves up to get air, to, to preserve their life, to save, to stay as long as they could. They would be... <sighs> they would weaken. <sighs> Is that not what we do? We push against God. We push against His wills. We, we try to save our own life. We try to preserve ourselves. 
We get angry at God when He takes what we love. We get angry at God. We push against Him. We push Him. I don't understand God, but I, we push. When they came to Jesus, they did what they would do with other men. At least they tried. To speed up the process, they would take a blunt object and bust the legs of those that were on the cross to where they could no longer push. They, all they could do was submit, lose their air, and suffocate and die when they came to Jesus to speed up the process. They didn't break his legs. You know why? Two reasons. One, the prophet said, not one bone of his body shall be broken. And you listen to me, when God says it'll be that way, you better mark it down. It'll be just how God says it. But you know why else they didn't break his legs? They didn't have to. He was already dead. When he got on the cross, he did not push. He did not rebel. He did not go against. He did not try to save his life. He submitted, surrendered, and gave it. He even said in John chapter 10, nobody will take my life. I will lay it down of myself. Listen to me. Look at me. Lean in and hear me. God will never take your life. He only accepts you giving it. You hear me? And Jesus fell from the pinnacle of glory all the way down. The light of heaven to the darkness of sin for man. Simply submitted. The purity of God to the impurity of flesh. All the way down, he fell and died. Paul said he would be the first fruit of many. We're all here today because of that. And he looks at us and he says, you do the same. Fall to the earth and give yourself to my will. Say, God, I'll be what you want me to be. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll be the man that you've asked me to be. I'll lay down my life. I'm yours, God. I die to myself. I die to my wishes. I die to my whims. My life is not mine. It belongs to you. I give myself. I give myself. I'm yours. I'm yours. Take my life, God. I give it all. I give, I give, I give my breath. Heart, use me for your glory. Use me for your glory. Whatever it means, if I live five years or 50 years, they all belong to you. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands, take my feet, my mouth, my eyes. Just take it all. Take it. Take it all, God. I give myself. Take it all, God. I give you take it all God use me to reach Claremont County use me for your glory use me to change somebody else's life I give myself to you I'm yours God everything that I am everything that I'm not everything that I ever hoped to be everything that I'm God it's it's all yours. Fall to the earth and die. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the gospel. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. Or that mother that lost her young son or that daddy that lost his young daughter or whatever it may be. And you say, God, I give my all to you. Your glory is what mattered for the man that was successful and gave it. 
for the guy that had talent and gifting to do anything. He says, I'll preach. <laughs> I die. And you better believe if you come up here this morning and plant yourself in this dirt, the devil's going to do everything he can to resurrect that old guy tomorrow. Paul said, I got to do this every day. <laughs> it's Monday, Lord, and I'm yours. I got to quit preaching. I never planted the garden in a suit. I don't know that I've ever planted the garden, but... I wonder if there's someone today who would say, I want my life to be like John the Baptist who said, I must decrease that he may increase. The problem with me, the problem with Troy Irvin is Troy Irvin. It's the same problem you've got. It's you. There's way too much of me and way too little of him. Do you hear me? John, I've got to quit. He's getting ready to give his life totally. Harold was going to cut his head off. And he started questioning. He said, go down there and ask Jesus. I guess he, he knew he was the one filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. He leaped inside his mother's womb. He knew Jesus, but he said, I'm getting ready to die now. Go down there and ask him, are you the one? <laughs> or should we look for another? And they went to Jesus, John's disciples, and said, are you the one? John wants to know he's getting ready to get his head cut off. And Jesus said, you go back and tell him. <laughs> Blinded eyes have been opened. Lame are leaping for joy. The mute are talking. The dead are being raised. And he said, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. You go back and tell John, you don't need to look any farther. <laughs> I'm the one. I want to tell you, Jesus is the one that's worthy of us laying down our life to serve forever. If the seed will serve him, there's only one way to start serving him. And that is to give your all. And maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I know you've preached a long time, but the Word of God has touched my heart. And this morning, without a moment's hesitation, as he starts to sing, even before I have to stand, I wonder who would get up out of your seat and say, I'm going to come forward and I'm going to present myself and say, Lord, here I am. I, I give my life to you totally. I get up from where I am in front of this crowd and I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'll be yours, God. I'll be your man. I'll be your woman. I'll be your boy. I'll be your girl. I want your life to define my life. Who would get up right now and say, I give myself to you, Jesus. I surrender all. I'm yours, God. How about it, Daddy? How about it, young man? You belong to God and you belong to you. I surrender all. All to be my blessed Savior. Everybody stand with me, please. You may say, Preacher, look at me, generations. Look at me. Some of the younger crowd in here, and I'm not slighting you, I just want you to hear me. You may say, I have no idea what you're preaching about. And the reason why you have no idea, have no point of reference, is because there used to be people in this nation that understood that there are some things worth giving your life for. World War II generation, you know what made them the greatest generation ever? They were willing to give their, literally, totally give their lives to stop Hitler and his regime and save the world, not just our nation. Listen to me. What made them great is they realized, my daddy used to always tell me, he says, some, there are some things worth living for and there are some things worth dying for. Do you hear me? And he would say, this is a great nation and it's worth dying for. Hear me? And as great as America has been and is, there's something much more greater worth dying for. And 
that's our Savior, Jesus. The reason why you struggle with that concept is because we've raised about two or three generations in this nation that we've given them everything to live with but nothing to live for, nothing bigger than them in their world. We've made it all about them. Listen, I want to give you the most startling revelation of your little hearts and your little life. This world does not exist for you. And God does not exist for you. You exist for Him and His service to this world. Get a hold of that. You're here to die to yourself and give yourself to Him. It's not about you. It's not about your happiness. It's about His glory. We're going to sing one more time. I wonder if there's anybody else that would join these people and say, I want to come and I want to surrender myself in total compliance to God's will. Sing it one more time. I surrender. I surrender. that would like to gather in. I'm going to pray with you and bless you and go. I want to ask you two things. Number one, do you love me? That could have been a lot more convincing. I'm going to say it one more time. Do you love me? I love you. Hey, if you're online and you love me, just type it and we'll type back because I love you too. Something else I want to ask you. Will you come back next week? You need to hear the rest of this series. Don't dismiss it. God is doing something. You be here. Bring someone with you. God is doing something. He's bringing something that's going to change the course of nature if we'll let it. Okay? Let me bless you. Father, I praise you and thank you for every person that's been here. And I pray that this message that you gave, I didn't give it, you gave it. I pray that it will resonate in each mind and heart. Would it, would it, would it resume? Would it replay? Would it go over and over like a recording in their head all day long, all week long? May it echo in their ear and in their spirit. I pray that it will reverberate off their heart all week long. God, use this simple little message to change our world by changing each and every one of us. May each of us be open to your word and your will. As we leave this place, may we look to you and trust you this week and every week. In Jesus' name, God's people said amen. amen. God bless you. Be reverent to the Holy Spirit as he works with these that are praying. Be reverent to the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you and I praise you. Except that corn of wheat fall to the earth and die, it remains a man. But if it die, oh, but if it die, what can you do with it? What can you do with it, God? What can you do with a heart and mind that's totally surrendered to you? What can you do with a God?